are far worse things great men than death. What's up, my wizards? It's Dev. From SBMTG, we like magic, and yesterday I did a poll on Patreon to help me determine what deck I was going to do today. And the winner, by knockout, and thus the deck we're going to do today, is Mardu Planeswalkers. Seriously, you guys really wanted to see this deck, at least compared to the other options in the poll? Like, there were four different options here, and Mardu Walkers walked away with, pun intended... We'll say it's intended. Marty Walker's walked away with almost half of the vote, 46%. It's a proper landslide. And by the way, just saying, a little aside here, if you want to participate in awesome polls like that, feel like one of the cool kids, and in a way, affect the very history of the world in a chaos theory kind of way, then all you have to do is throw me a dollar a month. Just let me hold a dollar on Patreon. Link in the description. But anyway, let's talk about this deck. Well, I know why you clicked on the video, more than likely, so I'm going to go ahead and show you what got you in the door in the first place. We're playing eight Planeswalkers in this deck, and we'll start with the two copies of Gideon of the Trials. See, what I like about Gideon is that, kind of more than any other Planeswalker in the deck, he just straight up forces an answer. Like, some Planeswalkers can win the game by themselves. That's something we say about a lot of walkers, but Gideon's a little bit different. He just makes it to where they can't win the game, as long as he's out, and that is important because it has a way of drawing removal out of the opponent's hand, like Cast Out and Vraska's Contempt, and that clears the way for our other walkers. Our opponent will be devoid of answers for our other important cards because they have to answer a Gideon or else they just can't win. And Gideon's just kind of like baseline good in a lot of situations, like in grindy mid-range matchups. When you got a good team around him to protect him, Gideon really shines. And like Approach of the Second Sun decks, particularly hate this dude. And, you know, he can even swing in for a good chunk of damage. So unlike real life, there's a lot of situations where you might want to tag in Roman Reigns here. But up next, you knew she'd be here. We got to run some Chandra's Torch of Defiance. I'd say three. It's probably a good number. You know, not only is she awesome in a Super Friends deck, but I'd say you make the argument that Chandra is just the straight up best card in the entire format. Seriously, Chandra slices, dices, burns, spurns, and she'll cook him well in a couple of turns. This thing just does everything. It does everything. You know, it's card advantage and it's ramp, which doesn't get talked about enough. The ramp is actually really relevant. Really, though, that second ability does a lot. It can allow you to play a 5-mana Walker or Glorybringer on turn 5, even if you don't get a land on that turn, or it can give you up to 7 mana on turn 5. That allows you to make some really important corner plays. Like, after board, you can Sweltering Suns on turn 5, still have the mana left over to cast out on your opponent's turn, whether you're fighting against Rekindling Phoenix, Hazaret, Glorybringer, whatever. So, so, actually, the ramp opens up a lot of important plays. Oh, and by the way, she kills most creatures. Oh, and by the way, her ultimate just murders people. So, like, Chandra is absolutely incredible. Easily the best card in the deck. And again, maybe the best card in the format. One more thing, actually. I called Gideon Roman Reigns a second ago. So, while we're talking about wrestling, you guys seen Becky Lynch? It's a straight-up ripoff of Chandra. Look at that. It's just Chandra. So, like, I'm beginning to wonder if all the walkers are just WWE personalities. So, like... What about Jace? Who's Jace supposed to be? Like, sort of the face of the company, an old fan favorite, but when he comes back, he gets booed now. Oh my god. Is Jace supposed to be... It's possible. It's definitely possible, but it's a question for another time because we got more walkers to discuss. We're playing two copies of Angrath the Flame Chain, and I don't know who he's supposed to be. Kane, maybe. Anywho, Angrath is cool because he's good against lots of stuff. Like, almost no matter what you're playing against, Angrath's kind of cool. You know, you resolve him against control, making him discard is sweet, and hitting him for a couple of damage every time is pretty awesome, you know? <laughs> just give it enough time, you can just win the game by plussing him every turn, so that's pretty cool. And they take the two even if you don't make them discard, so that's kind of cool. But in any case, this can also be decent against aggro decks, too, because of its second ability. Definitely awesome. And even if you don't kill the creature at the end of that ability there. It's still sweet to be able to steal dudes. That's You'll totally take that. And the third ability, the ultimate there, is really awesome against Godfarer's Gift and Control decks too. If you can get to the point in the game where you can actually fire off the ultimate, this will kill Controller Godfarer's Gift pretty easily. So five mana for a pretty good spread of abilities against the entire meta right now, I will definitely take. Definitely take. At least a couple of copies of Angrath need to be in the main. 
But I got one more walker in the main deck. There's another one in the sideboard. But I got one more main deck walker I want to talk about. And it might surprise you, honestly, but I am playing one copy of Watley Warrior Poet in this deck. Seems crazy, I know, but like, I kind of feel bad for Watley. I feel like the format moved on from this card and like, just nobody cares. Like, whenever somebody brings up Watley, people, are in the, there's somebody in the back like, nobody cares! And we just move on. <laughs> so, but I actually think that Watley is pretty, that'll be the entire comment section now. Nobody cares. But anyway, I actually think that Watley is worth reconsidering right now. For one, the zero ability is actually super relevant. I like the ability to just make a dude every turn. Especially a fat dude. You know, a 3 3 dinosaur is pretty sweet to do literally every turn as long as you can keep Watley protected. And even her first ability is at least alright. You know, we've got some creatures in the deck that deal damage to us, so this is a way of getting a little bit of that life back. That's sweet. And we've got some big dudes in the deck too, so we can gain a big chunk of life sometimes with that first ability and stockpile the last ability, which is really the main attraction with Watley. Even a fresh Watley can lead to two for ones sometimes and even three for ones against like tokens decks and stuff. But if you stockpile even a couple of loyalty counters onto her and then use her last ability, this can lead to two and three for ones on much bigger dudes or you can just make a whole board of creatures unable to block, just effectively making all of your dudes unblockable, which that is very relevant late in the game. Just try her out. I know that we've all sort of come to the conclusion that Watley is bad. <laughs> you know, I know that some of you are bristling like a Hydra at the inclusion of this card, but try her out. Give her a shot. She actually does a lot of really cool stuff right now. That ultimate is unbelievable. Again, even if she's fresh, the ultimate can be really good for killing a couple of dudes or just getting some of your guys through. And again, the ability to make a creature every turn, nothing to sneeze at. So give Watley a try. I think she earns her slot. I don't want to play... A bunch of copies. You know, I don't want to see Wally all day, but I do like taking the chance of seeing one copy of her over any given game. But we got to play some creatures in our deck to help protect our planeswalkers and get in damage of their own, you know? I deliberated a lot on whether or not I wanted to play like a Sweltering Suns package with a bunch of removal up under and on the curve, or whether I wanted to play some creatures in the main deck. And in the end, I feel like creatures are the better way to go here rather than just playing a butt ton of removal. So if you play all the removal in your deck, then you're really, really good against aggro, but you don't have really any early interaction. You just have a bunch of dead cards against control decks. Well, creatures have the ability of, you know, jumping in front of our walkers for us and getting in damage, trading in combat with other aggro decks, or conversely, just getting in fast damage in the early game against control decks. So I felt like creatures were definitely the right call here. We're going to play 16 of them, starting with four copies of Glintsleeve Siphoner. Well, Glintsleeve is just kind of everything, you know? Still in love with this card. We need more stuff to draw us cards than just Chandra. Check. We need some early interaction, get some quick damage in against control. Check. We need something to trade early in the game with aggro creatures. Check. Glintsleeve just does literally everything. So we will play this card. Now, to have another two-drop creature, I'm also going to play three copies of Adanto Vanguard. Another card that if you're a fan of the channel, you kind of know that I'm in love with. Again, just punish it. Slow starts really, really well. This thing will put up nine for you before you know what's going on and before they know what's going on. But in this deck, it's doubly cool. Not only is it super aggressive, but it can jump in front of a planeswalker and just take the hit. You know, you can just become indestructible and live to block another day. So there's a lot of really cool stuff about Vanguard in this deck. Super aggressive when you need it, defensive when you need it too. Moving up the curve, I'm going to play a couple of copies of PNA Lar in this deck. She's just an all-star, super versatile card to this day. PNA Lar is still amazing. And like just does not get enough credit, which I don't, she's in a lot of different decks and people still just don't talk about PNLR. She's just a curve filler who does a couple of sort of corner things, but no, I think Pia actually has a lot of different applications in this format. First of all, she can make two blockers for a planeswalker. That's cool. She can make a flying creature. That's pretty sweet. Flying blockers are nice in this deck. She's a mana sink that can pump that flying creature. She can also sacrifice this artifact to make other bigger flyers nigh unblockable. There's just so many cool things that this thing does, you know? It's especially nice to have a mana sink and getting two bodies out of one play is especially good in a Super Friends deck. So... Pia really just kind of ties everything together in the 3-drop slot. That's another thing, by the way, is we need more stuff in the 3-drop slot. Pia fills the slot really, really well. 
But speaking of three drops, we're also going to make room for a couple of copies of Aethersphere Harvester in the deck. Any creature can crew this from Glint Sleeve to Adanto to the Thopter that Pia gives us. It's pretty easy to get this thing crewed in the deck. And it also does everything super awesome against aggro, helps extend the game. The lifelink's super important, blocks Rekindling Phoenix, blocks Glory Bringer, gets in flying damage of its own. Just yes, for three mana that doesn't tax the mana base in a three color deck. Just. Awesome, awesome. Extra energy for Ether Hub or Glint Sleeve, whatever you're doing. Just like, we, we definitely need at least a couple copies of this. I don't want to run too many because even though we do have creatures to crew it, we don't have all the creatures in the world to crew it. So I only want to play a couple of copies, but it's especially good with stuff like a Danto Vanguard. You know, if they go to sweep you, you can just make a Danto indestructible. Ether Sphere won't get hit by a sorcery speed sweeper. So the next turn, still got a pretty good board. You know, you can swing in with a Danto if you want to, make it indestructible if you have to, or you can create your Ether Sphere with it. So you've still got a pretty decent board after sweepers. Just Ether Sphere is awesome in this deck, and it's got not only a lot of corner applications, but just a lot of straight-up good gameplay that you can get out of it. But here's where we get to the ugly dudes. We're going to play three copies of Rekindling Phoenix, because I don't have to explain that. I could actually probably just end the discussion of Rekindling Phoenix right there, but I'll go ahead and tell you all the stuff you already know. You know, Big Dumb Flyer, super easy to get through, ends games quickly can force exile removal, or force two-for-ones. You know, they'll kill Rekindling Phoenix, and then they'll kill the token before your next upkeep. So this just kind of does it all. Whether, again, for, forcing a two for one out of your opponent is especially important in a deck where you have so many threats that they have to worry about. They want to use their removal on other stuff, definitely. So they don't want to get two for one, and they also don't want to be forced to use exile removal. Again, cast out, Brass's Contempt, Every copy of those cards they're using on a Rekindling Phoenix is a Planeswalker that we get to keep out. So this Rekindling Phoenix is awesome for applying pressure. But there's more big, stupid red flies. We're also going to play two copies of Glorybringer because, of course, I, I really shouldn't have to explain that, you know. We're already running some five drops in our Planeswalkers here, but I think we can stretch it and play a couple of copies of Bringer. Honestly, the, re the five mana Planeswalkers are the only reason I'm not playing the full four of Bringer. Just crazy haste threat. Five mana is definitely the right price for this super dumb haste flyer giant guy that kills him in a few turns and can bust up creatures if you wanted to. Just yes to literally everything about Glorybringer. We have to make room for at least a couple of copies. There's no reason not to. Now, even though I didn't go the like sweltering suns and 20 removal spells <laughs> route here, you know, I still think it'd be dumb not to play removal. We should play some of that. So let me show you all of that real quick before we go on to the lands in the sideboard. We're going to play two copies of Magma Spray, four copies of Harness Lightning, two copies of Abrade, and three copies of Cast Out. Now, most of these are self-explanatory. You know, I really like Magma Spray right now for taking out Earthshaker Kenras and taking out opposing Adanto Vanguards. That's occasionally relevant. So there's a lot of creatures that I'd really rather kill forever than only kill once in this format, including Scrap Heaps, Crowdger. There's a whole list. Harness Lightning and Abrade, though, are the two most flexible red removal spells in the whole format. You know, Harness Lightning can kill a big guy or it can kill a small guy and leave some energy behind. If, even against Control, if they don't have any dudes out, you can target one of your own guys, not spend any of the energy. You just got three free instant Instant speed energy. Well, not free, it costs two mana, but whatever. Instant speed. You can draw a card next upkeep with Glint Sleeve Siphoner or Fuel a Dry Ether Hub. There's lots you can do with it. And a braid, obviously, not only can take out small creatures, but can kill Godfrey's Gifts and Heart of Kirin's and a bunch of other stuff that you might worry about right now. But the cast out might deserve a little bit of explanation, actually. You could play Ixalan's Binding in this slot or Vraska's Content, but I think this is a little bit better than both. It's a little easier to cast than Vraska's Content in this deck. I don't really want to have to worry about double black so much, and it's instant speed, like Vraska's Content, but unlike Ixalan's Binding. In a deck where you're trying to protect your Planeswalkers, it's important to have an instant speed answer to haste creatures. You know, everything from Oncrap Crasher to Hazaret to Glorybringer can just come down and immediately, even on a more or less empty board, just kill a Planeswalker. We don't want that to happen. I'd much rather have an instant speed answer like Cast Out than something like Ixalan's Binding. And, you know, if we don't need it in any given time, we just draw a card off of it for one. 
Now here's the mana base right here. We're playing 25 different lands, and if you count the Ether Hub as a source of each color, it shakes out to 18 red, 15 white, and 14 black. That is more than enough sources to get everything done, but we don't get access, at least in this version of the build, to any sort of colorless lands like Scavenger Grounds or Field of Ruin or Arch of Araska. These are great, but I mostly wanted to focus on hitting the sources that we need, especially if we want to hit Gideon by turn 3. 15 white sources isn't enough to do it super reliably, but the good news is you don't have to hit Gideon by turn three. He's great on turn five or six. So I think we've got the right sources. I mostly wanted at least 18 red, and we built the rest around that. Now, as far as the sideboard here, we've got answers against a little bit of everything, but I'll take you through our aggro answers first. We're going to play a copy of Chandra's Defeat, two copies of Authority of the Consoles, and three copies of Sweltering Suns. Here's the Sweltering Suns in the board. Against aggro, we absolutely do need this, so we'll board it in against Mono Red. And for what it's worth, I think Mono Red is going to get way more popular after Challenger decks come out. At least if we're, when we're talking about on the ground level, at your LGS and at FNMs and stuff like that. I think that Mono Red is definitely the best of those Challenger decks, and they're going to get really popular. One would, would, would imagine, at least, when they come out. So Sweltering Suns and Authority of the Consoles are going to be very important sideboard pieces. And I like Authority, too, especially considering I was just talking about how there's a lot of haste creatures in the format that just eat walkers, uh, if we're not careful, at, at least. So Authority is good for making those same haste creatures come into play tapped and letting us get into the late game. As far as control, we've got four whole copies of Duress and a copy of Direfleet Daredevil. I didn't want to play a whole bunch of copies of Daredevil, but I think at least one is fine. He could probably go up to two if you found room in this board because this is a very good card against control. You know, it's a body and one of their spells, whether it draws you cards or, you know, a Vrastus Contempt against their own Scarab God. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with the Daredevil. Now in the other category, I'm going to run extra copies of a Braid and Cast Out. These are both decent against aggro and pretty good too against Godfair's Gift and other combo decks. So I want to run more copies of them. But I'm also going to run a copy of Liliana Death's Majesty and a copy of Cut to Ribbons. Now both of these are good in grindy mid-range matchups against like snake decks or green-red monsters. These cards can shine. Liliana can give you card advantage in the form of reanimation can be really important with glory bringers and stuff or even just bringing a, a danto vanguard so flint sleeves back that's fine too just a form of card advantage and reach in the late game can be really good and of course she can just make creatures herself that's you know if you want to fill the board with tokens she can do that in grinds as well and her ultimate can just completely murder people as well um, late, late, late in the game. So if you're going to get that late in the game against a mid-range deck, then Liliana is a consideration. Same thing with Cut the Ribbons. There's no problem finding a target for this against mid-range decks. It can be great against snake decks, for instance. And the Ribbons can be super awesome on, like, turn 12 for just closing a game out. And finally, here was your Pavel Rankins right here. Final score of 68. That is, that is the highest score in a good long time here because this is a very competitive deck. There's a reason the power stat is all the way up there at 9 get dunked on most other decks that have been playing on the channel recently. It felt good to play this deck. This deck has a ton of crazy pieces in it and it might not have a whole bunch of synergy or anything, but when you're playing some of the best walkers and some of the best creatures and some of the best removal, that leads to a ton of versatility and yeah, you gotta sequence your turns right and you especially have to know what you're playing against but after you get a few games in a skilled pilot can take this deck very far so i hope you give it a try but the price tag i should warn you is right up there with a deck like marty vehicles or grixis or any of the most expensive decks in the format the price tag to play this thing is right around 325 dollars on tcg player right now and if you are interested in giving this thing a try or even just looking at the list i imagine you might want to check this list out just click the first link in the description that'll take you over to my sponsor tcg player it's a kid player they help the channel out and they are the cheapest place you can get this deck that 325 dollars price tag i quoted it's really only available through them you go through other vendors this deck Will cost you $400 easy. So click the link in the description, order it from them if you're going to get it from anywhere. But she's tapped out for now, ladies and gents. That's all we got for this one. I hope you enjoyed this one. I am seriously, I got a lot of faith in this deck. It's, it felt really good playing like a good deck again. <laughs> so, you know, I got a lot of faith in this one. So give this thing a shot if you possibly can and let me know how you felt about it down there in the comments section. You can also like the video if you liked it, 
Super low effort helps the channel out a lot. You can also sub if you want to expend slightly more effort. Hit the bell for the notifications because there's more decks. Dominaria spoilers coming down the pipeline soon. You can also follow me on Twitter at SBMTGDev or throw me a dollar on the aforementioned Patreon.com slash SBMTG and I'll let you know what decks are doing the day before I upload them. But pretty sure that's it. I'm pretty good, getting pretty good at the YouTube spiel. But I'm pretty sure I'm done for this one, you guys. I'll catch you cats later. I'm Dev from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.